So thank you, everybody, uh, and welcome to our first uh, virtual uh, meeting for 2021. And we've got a great show for everyone uh, this evening. So um, thank you all for joining. And uh, we are going to kick it off um, with our own Phyllis Lang. And Phyllis has been a member of the Raleigh Astronomy Club since uh, Halley's uh, Comet appeared in 1986. She and her husband, Mark, are definitely regulars at Rack Events. You may also know Phyllis as the owner and operator of Nightware and her Deep Sky Planner observation um, uh, software. Uh, her math and software background have made calculating orbits uh, an interesting endeavor. So with that, we're gonna hand it over to Phyllis. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So I'm wondering, uh, I haven't used the little red laser pointer in a Zoom before. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. I wonder how you unsee it. <laughs> there we go, maybe. Uh, there we go. Uh, okay, so when I first began to be interested in astronomy, um, comets and asteroids were interesting, especially comets, because when I joined the club, Halley's Comet was coming. And that is what got me interested in going to the club. And so I guess understanding comets and orbits and how to observe them and such was a really key part of me getting into this hobby. And being mathematical, I enjoyed learning about the orbits and what it takes to calculate when and where you're going to see a comet or asteroid. And I hope to go through this presentation without confusing folks with uh, equations and such. So if you look at the diagram here on this first slide, you can tell that there's, there's a lot going on. I'm not the best at 3D um, thinking. I'm, I'm much better at 2D thinking. So I'm going to do my best for you but I am really going to try to keep it no formulas. Let's keep it without all that. So let's see what it takes to do that. What do you think, Mark? What's it going to take? Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, ele uh, the elements are not really scary. Um, I studied math in college. I've always enjoyed math. I've been a software developer for a few years. And I know that not everybody really enjoys math the way I do. So if you really do like math, uh, the book that I'm showing here, Astronomical Algorithms, if you happen to be looking at the camera, there we go. This is my age old copy. It's got all the math in it you need to do these calculations, if you enjoy that kind of thing. It's a Wilman Bell publication. So Wilman Bell has closed, and it might be hard to find this book now. But if you can find it and you're in, into the math, it's an excellent source. Um, as I say, I'll be using diagrams instead of equations. Hopefully we can all discuss that and understand it a little more easily. One thing that does come into play here is that we're gonna to have to talk about Kepler and Newton because they are two of the key players in developing all this um, concept and the rigorous math that goes behind it. So let's see, yeah. So as with anything astronomical, it's a game of when and where. So we need to know when and where we are, and thankfully we know those things, but then we want to figure out when and where to look for the comet or the asteroid. And all these uh, equations and parameters and such will lead us to that. Um, you can see a picture of my age old calculator there. 
I still use that to do some of the calculations. Computers are much more efficient. But it turns out that the arithmetic, for those of you that are interested, uh, it's, it's a lot of trigonometry. So if you understand trigonometry, this will be duck soup. It turns out many years ago when I was writing the software, I, I was very familiar with plain trigonometry, but not spherical trigonometry. That's not something we were ever taught. So it, I just happened to have my grandmother's college trigonometry book. I don't know how it found its way to me, but it did come to me. And that explained everything. It's very much like plain trigonometry. The, the concepts are very much the same. So uh, the when and where is what we need to figure out here. Now, when we try to begin to understand the when and the where, how to calculate it, the first step really is Kepler. And in the early 1600s, Kepler came up with his uh, three laws. And the first one is the law of planetary motion. And he decided and informed us at that time that planets traveled in elliptical orbits. If you happen to remember your iconic sections, uh, an ellipse is as shown in this um, picture, it's a squash circle. So- um, I cast to- um... Excuse me? It should be on that screen. Yeah, whatever. Um, the Greek conic, conic sections are the circle, which is a very special case of an ellipse. And then we have parabolas and we have hyperbolas. So Kepler told us that the planets traveled in an elliptical orbit where the sun was at a special place defined for an ellipse called a focus. So any of our planets are gonna travel in an orbit like this, and this would be the focus where the sun is. So that was Kepler, that was, you know, 1610 or something. And he learned that by uh, staring at observations made by his mentor, who was Tycho Brahe, or however you wanna say it. Um, so that was Kepler. The next thing that came along was Newton. And the reason we need Newton is because asteroid and comet elements aren't the same as planetary um, orbits. The math just doesn't fit the asteroids and the comets and we can talk about why further. But Newton taught us that there was a gravitational interaction between bodies, massive bodies. And the amount of force between the bodies would vary according to the distance. The closer the masses are, the stronger the force. The further apart they are, the weaker the force. The reason this matters is that some of these planets have a great amount of mass compared to a little asteroid or a little comet. And when that comet or asteroid passes by Jupiter, for example, Jupiter bends the orbit. So that's what I'm going to call the perturbers. There are bodies out there that bend the orbit. So these bodies are not traveling the same way that planets do. And it was due to Newton's gravity theory that we learned why this was happening. Now, asteroids and comets can have elliptical orbits. And these are the bodies that you see coming back periodically. Here you might think of Halley's Comet. It comes about every 76 years. There are other comets and asteroids that don't come back. Um, comet Kohutek in the mid 70s comes to mind because it was all in the news and I just wanted so bad to see it before it went away. I would never see it. Well, I never did see it. <laughs> But as, if I remember correctly, it was in a parabolic orbit. So we, we only got the one pass and I didn't get to see it. So how is it that we 
model these orbits? How do we come up with some kind of a formula? Well, first of all, you have to take very many observations so that you can estimate the orbital model. Uh, in the United States, the Minor Planet Seer, uh, Center is the big clearinghouse for, for orbit calculations and for observations. So they collate all the observations for an object and they update uh, the orbital elements, which we'll get to in a second, so that we're able to calculate where things are going to be. So there are other um, institutions in the world that uh, calculate and collate these, these uh, observations. But the Minor Planet Center is the big one. Uh, there's another one in the United States that is particular, particularly strong with near-Earth objects. And that would be uh, the solar system dynamics people from JPL, I think. Um, and we'll, talk, we'll show that link in a few minutes because they're a wonderful link to refer to. Now, when we start drawing pictures and talking about these diagrams, uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat list so that we can discuss it. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of talk about this crazy interstellar object uh, called a Mau Mau. And if you know how to say it better than that, please tell me. I took that pronunciation from my cat. She says meow, meow. Um, at any rate, when it first came into the news, we thought it was a comet. And this diagram shows us a plot. It came from, uh, it came from far, far out of the solar system. So it came from above and it went down below the ecliptic and then it shot back up. I looked at the orbital elements for that yesterday and it is a hyperbolic orbit. It's not coming back. So just by looking at this diagram and by understanding that that's a hyperbolic shape, we'll never see this guy again. But it also tells us that uh, these uh, bodies, asteroids and comets, they can come from any direction they change over time, and their orbital plane, the plane over which their orbit travels, it, it can be any, any orientation to the Earth. They, they come from everywhere. So that's a Mau Mau. There was another one uh, in 2019, I think. Mark and I were discussing it today called Borisov, and that was a comet. So now we have a known comet and a known asteroid that have come from outside the solar system, and we won't be seeing them again. So this business of elements, what exactly are they? They are just parameters that you plug into an equation. They're not that many, six or eight, and we have known equations we can plug them into. Um, I know that not everybody isn't going to enjoy plugging these into equations. So I will show you uh, towards the end of the talk some web pages where you can ask a service to give you uh, the time and location for these objects and it will compute for you and you don't have to fool around with plugging in values. However, when you are looking uh, at a very newly discovered comet or asteroid, the general systems haven't been updated yet. You might be able to get uh, the elements and you would plug those into some software you may have and be able to determine that way when and where to view. But until the systems are updated with these elements, you will have to plug the elements into some software um, yourself. Now, I did look at um, Stellarium the other day. You seem to be able to look up an object by its name, and you don't have to enter parameters there. Um, I think the same is true of Starry Nights, maybe, 
but some software will require you to enter these elements. And again, all they are is parameters. They're numbers that you plug into equations. The naming of these elements is kind of clever. Some of them have Greek alphabet letters to identify them. And I'll be showing those in a moment. So if the software you may be used to using shows these Greek letters, at least you can match them up with their English name equivalents and you'll have an idea of what they're describing. So anyway, if you look up an object by its name, you'll get a list of these elements. So naming these objects is kind of a special consideration and I'll go over that towards the end of the talk. But for now, the elements are derived from the observations. They're math models that come up with these, these elements. But first of all, you have to contribute observations. There are observatories around the world um, that do this. There are some pretty high level amateurs that do this. And uh, I would say the math to reduce the observations is probably significant stuff. I've never done it. Of course, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Okay, so the newly discovered objects, asteroids or, or comets, have their elements updated pretty often until the model becomes stable. So if you Let's say you hear in the news today about some comet named Leonard, which should be making a pass towards the end of this year, Comet Leonard. I looked for its elements the other day and they weren't up yet. I would expect that the elements will change somewhat frequently over the next couple of months as the observations are collected and the model for its orbit is refined. So if there's a new comet or asteroid you want to view, check its elements frequently. Anyway, these elements, again, are changing because of the perturbers. <laughs> anyway, perturbation caused very often by Jupiter, possibly by other bodies. Now, being a mathematician, we always have to define some terms. Um, sorry about that. It's just the way I have to be. Uh, the perihelion is going to be a word that we encounter several times tonight. It is the closest point in the object's orbit around the sun. It is, uh, it is a point in space. It also is a time. We have to keep up with the time that perihelion occurs. The way astronomers represent time is a Julian date, which is just a, a decimal number. Um, it has a start there. You can see it on the slide. Minus 4712 is, I don't know when that was, a long time ago. It is possible to convert a Julian date to a modern calendar date. And a lot of these online ephemeris generators do that for you. So if the double precision date of today, which is what, 2,459,237, if that number doesn't do much for you, you can usually get the calendar date that corresponds to that. Now, the last term uh, is the ecliptic. So we have two planes of reference um, that we can talk about. We can talk about the ecliptic, which is uh, the orbital plane that the Earth and most of the planets orbit on. The difference in the orbital plane of the Earth and other planets is just a couple of degrees, with the exception of Pluto. Pluto is really skewed, but the ecliptic is, is the plane of the orbit of the planets. The other thing we can talk about is the celestial equator, which is a projection of the Earth's equator out into space. And you should probably know 
that Earth is tilted on its axis from the eclipse, and that's why we have seasons. The, the ecliptic is what we travel around space, around the sun on, and the celestial equator is about 23 and a half degrees skewed to the ecliptic. But that's, that's not as important as the ecliptic for tonight's discussion. Um, there's a number that you run into among the elements, which is called the epoch. And that is a time when all of these values are accurate. And if you think about the mathematical models, it's the time when all these numbers are correct. So they have to compute uh, these models. And it's an iterative uh, computation, as far as I know, that, um, God, what's the right word? They coalesce around a certain time. So generally, you're going to see these uh, epic, the epic number, which is T0. It's usually expressed as a decimal number, which is a Julian date. Hopefully, the software you use will show you a calendar date because it's a lot easier for humans. The next thing, uh, to me, it's the most important element to just look at and understand. And that's the eccentricity of the orbit. So it's usually denoted by little e. If you see little e exactly equal to zero, then the orbit is a circle. And I'm not aware of any body that has an orbit that's a circle. Usually you'll see little e is less than one. And that tells us the orbit is an ellipse. And most reasonably sized ellipses, and I'll leave it at that for the moment, most of those come back. Those bodies that follow uh, an orbital track whose eccentricity is less than one is going to come back because it's traveling in an ellipse. Now, if little e is exactly equal to one, now we have a parabola. Well, I'm sure everybody's fascinated with parabolas, but what that really means is that the object's not coming back. It's coming towards the sun and it's going to shoot back out into space. The same is true when little e is greater than one. That describes a hyperbolic orbit. And again, the object comes in by the sun and shoots out the other side into outer space. So when you begin to have these large eccentricities, these are objects that aren't coming back ever. If you remember your high school math, we have an, an ellipse and the sun is at one focus. We talked about that with uh, Kepler. And when the eccentricity is exactly one, we get a parabola. When the eccentricity is greater than one, we're getting the hyperbola. And I'll leave the direct directrix. Di I can't even say it. Direct directrix. Yeah. We'll leave that alone. <clears throat> now, one of the values you see, usually among the elements, is the mean anomaly, which is I don't know what in the world that could possibly trigger in anybody's mind. So I just define it. The mean anomaly is the angle between the object, wherever it is at the time, um, in relation to the perihelion point. And it's a mean. So it's not... We don't really expect this to be fixed. We expect it to change a little bit. At any rate, if I were to draw a line from the perihelion point of the orbit out here to the asteroid or comet, that would be the mean anomaly. So there's that one. The next item of interest is the perihelion distance. Distances seem to be okay with the way people's minds work. It's just the distance from the sun 
to the perihelion. So some objects come very close to the sun, so the perihelion distance would be small. Some objects don't come that close to the sun, and perihelion distance will be larger. This is usually expressed in astronomical units. So remember, the Earth is one astronomical unit from the sun, generally. So you probably are going to see perihelion distances smaller than one, larger than one. They could be anything. The next thing is another one that defies description to me, argument of perihelion. Now, you see up here, it's usually represented with a lowercase omega. And sometimes people write a W instead since their uh, keyboard doesn't have a lowercase omega, but you'll see it both ways. This is the angle between the Earth and the object's perigee point when the elements are computed, epoch. So in this drawing, it would be the angle between the Earth and the perihelion point <laughs> of the object. So here again, we have yet another angle. It takes a lot of angles to define this stuff. Perhaps that's why it's a little confusing. The mean motion per day, that's pretty straightforward. It's however many degrees um, the object is moving per day, and it's a mean motion. We know from Kepler that objects move more quickly when they're close to the sun than when they're far out in the solar system. So this is a mean motion. And I'm sure it is updated, um, but not very frequently. Uh, the longitude of the ascending node. This one actually makes a little bit of sense to me. Um, it's the location along the, the orbit, um, where the orbit crosses the Earth's uh, ecliptical plane, or equatorial plane, rather. And it's, it, it tells us how the comet's orbital plane is skewed to the Earth's equatorial plane. So there's an ascending node. That's, that's where the object goes above the Earth's orbit. And there's a descending node too, which describes where it goes beneath. So here again, these orbital planes, they're not coincident. They're, they can be skewed every which way. So anyway, this is the orbital the equatorial plane of the Earth, not the ecliptic plane of all the planets. Any questions yet? Okay. The next one is the semi-major axis. If you think back to your arithmetic, and we talked about eclipses, uh, ellipses, there's a long axis and there's a short axis. Well, the semi-major axis is half the distance of the whole long axis. That's why it's semi. So the distance from, say, the, the object, which in this case is an asteroid, um, half the distance of its entire elliptical orbit is called the semi-major axis. So it's half of that long axis. And you need that to be describing elliptical orbits. Uh, another thing is the inclination. This one's pretty easy. It's usually represented with a small i. It's the orientation of the orbit of the object with respect to the Earth's equator. Uh, the, the equator is projected into space. We talked about this. It's a celestial equator. This is usually measured in degrees. So if that comet is coming at a very high inclination, you can expect it to be coming from above in this picture or a very low inclination. You know, it would be coming in at a very shallow angle. So here are all the players together. And I saved this diagram to show, you know, after we discussed all of the, uh, the different elements, 
I find this diagram rather confusing. So if you do, join the club. However, uh, you can see some of the uh, angles that we talked about. They're here. Now, here I'm going to uh, list the elements. Generally, when you look up uh, online or in software, you look up uh, the elements for some object. It turns out that you see different elements for asteroids as compared to comets. And the reason that is that some of this stuff can be computed from other of this stuff. So often for asteroids, you'll see these things. And for comets, you don't see as many. All of these items are being computed, but you, uh, you can compute some from the others. Um, so anyway, you can see the, um, the abbreviations for the different angles and things and how they're referenced. If you have dealt with um, orbital elements in software, let's say you use uh, Starry Night or the Sky or something, you can put these elements into that software and you will see these names or these letters. This is what it's about. And then we come to the really fun part, which is naming. If you want to look up the elements for some comet or some asteroid, I, I don't know any way around this problem. You have to look it up by its name. The problem becomes the IU, the International Astronomical Union, they have a group that assigns names to all asteroids and comets and everything else. And the rules have changed over the years. So you can see old style names and new style names and everything in between. So just a couple of pointers on what these things mean. When you see P slash C slash I slash, you're generally looking at a comet. If you see P slash, that's a periodic comet. And you can probably count on seeing that again, hopefully in your lifetime, maybe not. At, at any rate, it's 200 years or less is the rule for the P. You'll see P and a year. And that's generally followed by the name of the discoverer. If you see C slash, that means it's a, it's a comet that won't return, uh, either in less than 200 years or ever. So these bodies that have paraboloidal or hyperbolic orbits, um, they don't come back. So they're generally going to have a C slash, unless you get into this third category, which is new, and it's the capital I slash. And that means an interstellar object. Um, and we have interstellar asteroids and comets. So uh, a Mau Mau was I slash one. It was the first object that was discovered to be of interstellar origin. Borisov would be uh, capital I slash two. Um, Last year, and this is kind of what got me interested in giving this presentation, we had a wonderful visit from Comet Neowise. Comet Neowise had the official designation of C2020 F3 Neowise. So we know that's a comet that's probably not coming back. It was discovered in 2020. Uh, it was the F3 is an encoded value. It does have a time meaning, but NEOIS is the instrument that found it. They discovered the comet. Now, asteroids aren't quite as complicated, I think. They, they can be numbered like one series. Series was the first asteroid that was assigned an official name. So the older, brighter asteroids are going to have names like that. More recently found ones uh, may be numbered or unnumbered, like the asteroid 2005 YU55. 
I, I can remember observing that in the front yard. And when we saw it, it was a near earth orbit object. It moved, you can watch it move. It moved so quickly through the sky, you could see it move. Uh, I think I think Mark took pictures of this. There's animation out there that he took, but it was later given an official number by the IEU, and that's what the parenthetical 308635. If you're deep into asteroids, you probably look at some category of asteroids. And here again, the elements change, they're updated frequently and you should become adept at getting those orbital element updates so that you can find, image, whatever it is you do with asteroids. So naming is, um, it's a bit of a trick. I think if you read the astronomical news, usually the bright comets are mentioned. And if you do an internet search for that name, you're probably going to get the proper designation for it. And then you can go and calculate an ephemeris using that designation name to look up the elements for it. So, so it's, it's a little bit of a uh, little bit of a search. Was there a question? Yeah, as so before you get too far along, um, we actually I think there is a there's a couple questions. Okay. Um, I had a question on um, uh, on the elements that you had, uh, I think a slide back, um, where you had all the elements. Do you know uh, which ones were, oh, the, uh, the, the, yeah, there you go. Um, which ones were, um, I know you said that there, there are some that are calculated um, from other elements. But do you know which ones were not calculated? In other words, um, is there like just a, a few that maybe are, okay, you measure these and you don't derive them. You don't derive them from other measurements. Is that, yeah. do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think these top ones here. Oh, okay. Are kind of uh, the ones that are deduced from observations. Um, some of these things, I know mean motion per day and the mean anomaly, you can calculate these, you can calculate the perihelion distance from all that. Okay. Um, seems like semi-major axis can be calculated from some of this. So to answer your question specifically, I would have to go back through and... Oh, well, yeah, yeah, you don't have to ask. I, I was just trying to see... You know, if there was a, you know, you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to measure like, you know, you're looking at this. There's, a, there's no. a lot there. Yeah, there is. <laughs> so, <laughs> some of it can be derived from others of it. And right. As far as I can remember, uh, yeah, okay. I can't give you a good straight answer. Okay. I mean, I can, but I can't give it to you right now. Oh well, that's all right. Um. <laughs> Uh, I, I was just, I was just curious, and then um, Mike had a question um, in regards to comets. Does any off-gassing or jets cause any permutations? It does cause a small amount. We know that when comets get close to the Earth, they become more active, and we think that the jets of gas that come off of the comets can nudge it. And here again, this is a thing where you want to watch those elements and update them frequently to see what difference it might have. Now, generally speaking, I would say there's not enough effect that you would go to the predicted position and it would not be there. Does that make sense? Okay. It says yes. Thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah, it does affect, but it's small. Jupiter's the booger. Yeah, it, it bounces things all around and even yeah. shoots them off into the York cloud. Um, I had one last question, um, and I think that at least that was all the ones we had in the chat. And then I had one last question for the for the ones that were like uh, the C slash, which is like a two hundred year plus or maybe never coming back, right. uh, which is the next slide. 
are those the ones with the seas are those do they know those are the ones that are actually in our solar system and then the eyes are the interstellar you know and of course well i guess do, do, those well, don't come back either do they it's got I mean, to do more with their origin oh okay the eye means yeah. it originated from interstellar space or so we think yeah the thing well, is that it's probably from the Oort cloud, perhaps, but is on a trajectory that will take it away. Okay. All right, that sounds good. I just okay. wanted to know what the difference was if, if I was reading that correctly. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so I have a, a question, Phyllis, um, and so this really has to do with perturbations. Yeah. Uh, so how um, are the... Uh, we, uh, how are the perturbations added into the equation? Or is it just that you just observe the object after it's passed a major gravitational well, and it, then you just recalculate? Or is there something that continually takes the uh, prior perturbations all together, sort of sum them all together in the, in the equation? I think that the math is based purely on observations. Mm -hmm. Makes so, make sense. You don't have a value of Jupiter's mass and apply it in the equation somehow. Right, that's what I was asking. We, yeah. yeah, we know it has an effect, but the predictions, the um, the elements themselves are derived from observations. Thank you. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's see if I can find my mouse. There it is. Okay, so. Here's the money slide for everybody. Um, you can go on to some places on the internet. And the Minor Planet Center is the one I think that Mark and I use the most. Uh, you'll need to know that official name. And you can ask the ephemeris service to calculate uh, the when and where for you over whatever uh, span of days you'd like for your latitude and longitude and this upper QR code uh, is the URL for that service. If you don't do QR, L, QR codes, you can see the URL here. You can also search the internet for the minor planet comet ephemeris service. That's, um, that's a really good service. For most things we look at. Now, if you're interested more in uh, near Earth objects, there's some, there's some extra math that's required to predict the position of a near Earth object. And the JPL Horizons system is the place to go for that. And you might guess this has something to do with JPL and NASA because they need to know where these things are so they don't hit a spacecraft that's in orbit somewhere. So they have to keep up with this stuff. And this QR, QR code here at the bottom of the page will take you to the JPL Horizons system. So those are the two, the two big ones. And I'm sure there are some in Europe, but I'll be darned if I know what they are. Bad on me. Anyway, that's a wonderful picture of Comet Hail Bob taken by Mark some years ago. It was a wonderful comet. Um, I believe that it, uh, it had a, an elliptical orbit, but more than 200 years. It was a little odd in that way. But what a pretty comet that was. Um, are there any other questions? Um, nothing, Phyllis, um, in the Zoom chat. I'm just going to go back to Facebook and see if anyone has posted anything there. So, um, nope, uh, no other questions. Um, although I'll, I'll kind of kick one off while we're waiting for people to either take themselves off mute or come up with a question. Um, with regards to the comments um, and the naming convention, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned kind of the, obviously the, 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 the prefix there. Um, uh, but after the year, there was the kind of a letter and a number. Um, and I think I might know what it is. Uh, at least I thought I knew what it was, where the letter might uh, refer to a 
to basically either the first half or the second half of a given month. So F for Comet Neowise would have been the second half of the third month. So, and then the three indicates it was the third comet found in the second half of the, of the third month. I, I think. think that's correct. Okay. Uh, but they had to make that so complicated. That's <laughs> kind of cryptic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of cryptic. But yeah, I think that sounds correct to me. Anyone so, else? Yeah, folks want to take themselves off of mute and go ahead and speak up. Oh, shoot. So um, I will ask uh, another question. Um, so, and, and related to you, fellas, only because uh, uh, definitely looking at the comments, out of um, Halley's Comet, Comet Hellbop, or recently Neowise. Um, care to rank them in order of uh, spectacular amazement or um, how you, yeah. uh, what, what you thought was the best uh, for viewing? I thought Hellbop was terrific. Uh, I definitely enjoyed Neowise. And Comet Halley visually wasn't that impressive, but historically it was terrific because I was just joining the club. We did a lot of public outreach and I had great reactions from different people. And I was able to show it to my 80 some odd year old grandfather who remembered seeing it as a kid. Oh, wow. So that was super cool. Um, so really, uh, visually, Halley's Comet was not the coolest thing I ever saw, but historically, it sure was special. What about you, Mike? What do you think is the best one you've seen? Well, I, I was not into astronomy uh, at the time of Comet Hellbop, which is very disappointing. But I have to say, I really enjoyed Neowise. And for the life of me, I cannot seem to remember the name of the comet. I think it was in 2007 that, although a tail wasn't very obvious, it all of a sudden kind of ballooned out so quickly. Um, Holmes? Was it not? Holmes? Comet Holmes. Holmes, yes. Yeah, Holmes 17 something. Yeah. Yeah, I've got pictures of it. And I have to say, that was amazing because I just remember even in the evening sky, in my uh, from my driveway in an apex, you could you could see it, and you know even with a very modest telescope, uh, you could you then just even you know night after night after night to see that thing just grow, grow, grow. Um, that was spectacular. Their comets are always different. They're just none of them are the same. They yep. they do what they do. That's why I enjoy looking at them. Mm -hmm. um, we we have one that's supposed to make a close approach to the sun in December, I believe. It's gonna be uh, an evening comet where you look right after sunset, I think. Um, but it's Comet Leonard. Mm -hmm. And I'll be watching to see how it behaves because you never know what you're gonna get with a comet. So I was going to ask about that. Um, I was just, is that, is that got the designator uh, uh, C2020X4, Leonard? Is that the one you're talking about? Uh, no, I think it's, I think it's 2021. Mm -hmm. A1, Leonard, maybe? That's what I'm seeing right now, A1. Yeah, yeah. I looked so for elements you. for it the other day, and they weren't out yet, so... Yeah, right, so that's out. pretty darn new. I mean, it was just discovered. First yes. comet discovered in the first two weeks of January. Yeah, uh, it was discovered by a dude named Leonard who works at Mount Lemmon in Arizona. So that just happened. Uh, 2021. I mean, if it has 2021 in the name. That means it happened in the year, right? Yeah. The year 2021. So, yeah. you know. People yeah. are looking for these things all the time. Yeah, I just downloaded Elements uh, from uh, Mcorp, and okay. I it's not on there. It's, I, I, the only Leonard I saw was was twenty twenty X four. Yeah, do you, Mark, do you know? I'm looking. Like, okay. 
Yeah. Did, you say, a did you say we're going to see that in December of this year? As far as I now know, yes. Okay. In other words, not soon. I have time to, okay. Yeah, you have time to think about it. And you'll, you'll be telling us stuff on the emails, I know. Well, somebody will, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All the photographers will be so excited. I just know they will be. So uh, do you know what the prediction is for the magnitude? And are we going to be in good position to see it in the Northern Hemisphere? Because one of my one of the frustrating things uh, I think a lot of times is that uh, they have these really great comets come by, but but generally uh, they're always in the southern hemisphere, uh, or or if they get to the northern hemisphere, they're like very very low, so you never really ever get to see them very well. So yeah, this one's going to be very mind? low. It's going to be very oh, low in the evening sky, and it the prediction right now is like fourth magnitude. So that's pretty good. We'll see what really happens. So would that be ascending, ascending or descending node? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, we're paying attention. We're paying yeah. attention. I stuck a link in the uh, in the chat that shows um, some info, the, the estimated magnitude and its currently estimated orbit. It sounds like it's going to be uh, just what Doug described. Like it's we're going to get it uh, right uh, very low, and then it's going to make a good uh, view in the southern hemisphere. We just all have to move. That's all there is to it for many uh -huh. reasons. All my friends in Australia like to tell us how we're so deprived and we don't know anything about whatever. <laughs> there was an article in there was an article in Sky and Telescope a few years back that tried to convince us that the North was oh good. They're like, well, you know, people in the South really want to see Cassiopeia, and you're like, well, <laughs> no, okay, <don't>. all right, <laughs> I mean, whatever. Compared to all the other stuff, yeah, it, you yeah. can keep it. And you've seen it, you've seen it. Uh, also want to just uh, a shout out to Caroline Ray. So thank you for um, uh, looking that up. Um, she found um, that um, that book that Phyllis referenced, the astronomical algorithms is available on uh, like uh, cell stair for 65. Amazon had it closer to a hundred bucks. Uh, and then I, I did put a link. I went out to, to, to the site and put a link in there as well. So if anyone is interested. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I went and looked it up. They, Amazon was 145 bucks for that book. Wow. So that, that is celestair.com. Uh, they do a lot of celestial navigation stuff. So if you're interested in that. Uh, but they, uh, they've also got uh, astronomical formula for calculators. Yeah. So, you know, it's that, kind of similar if you're interested in that. That I've book a, came out um, before this one did. It may have been updated, but this is the first edition. I have the second edition, but they're just, you know, they're not that big. You might think of math textbooks as being multi-inches thick. <laughs> there might be not. an app for it. <laughs> there might be. Yeah. The um, Astronomical League also has a book. It's $14. Um, yeah. I think it's called Math Math. Math for astronomers. Yeah, I amateur astronomers. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. and that's that's a it's a very you know it's a, it's, it's pretty a, thin. Yeah. It's pretty thin, you know. Um, but the, the it just has a, it has the math in there, and I I can't remember the exact you know what what equations it went through, but um you know it does have a section on orbits. Oh, it does. Okay. Yes, I know right. that for a fact. And I, I have a bit out. of an asteroid uh, short story here. When I was a little kid, the first telescope I ever saw was a gentleman in my, in my hometown. It ended up he had the largest observatory ever owned on Earth by any private citizen. In the 1930s, he spent a half a million dollars on essentially a 28-inch Smith camera like the 48-inch at Palomar. He give, when he died, but long before he died, he gifted that to the National Observatory in, uh, in New Mexico, in Flagstaff. And so for years and years and years, since the 50s, Flagstaff has been using this telescope, and it is the most prolific discoverer of near-Earth objects they've ever had. It was just something that was built to do that. And, and so it had a name that they called it for all these years, and they had no clue where it came from. Uh, just a few years ago, it was finally discovered that someone looked at the blueprints for this Schmidt uh, camera that was sitting there and noticed that 
it had in it the latitude and longitude of Martinsville, Virginia, which is where this guy was from. And the initials MS, which was Michael Shotland, he was the guy. So it was a real big to do. And in the end, JPL decided that they needed to name an asteroid Michael Shotland to commemorate his donation to, to the science, if you will. And so this happened just maybe four years ago. It finally happened. There is now an asteroid, Michael Shotland, circling out there. But part of the process that I learned as it was going on that was hilarious was they couldn't do it quickly. <coughs> they had to study it for a number of years and make darn sure it was no chance it would ever hit Earth. <laughs> so any of the named asteroids, you know, that are that you might see for famous people, those are all safe ones. That's that's what I learned from that. That is um, very interesting. I'd like to make a comment. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of you are talking about a book, different, various books. If there's a book that you're not going to want to read from cover to cover or keep forever, or you just want to check, is it worth me buying? Don't forget your local library can get you interlibrary loan. That way you can get your hands <coughs> on the book, see if it's worth buying, or maybe there's only two chapters that are, are dealing with what you're dealing with. But uh, the library is a very good for interlibrary loan. And although many times I say you can't renew, give it a shot. Usually you can renew. That's a great thing. Thank you.